Hello, good morning, and thank you to everyone for joining. My name is David Shulman, and I'm the Senior Director of the new Global China Hub here at the Atlantic Council. I'm excited to welcome you to today's session, which the Global China Hub is hosting with the Atlantic Council's Digital Forensics Research Lab as part of 360 STRATCOM, the DFR Lab's annual government-to-government -government forum. This year's 360 STRATCOM takes place on the margins of the Summit for Democracy, which is designed to promote human rights, address corruption, and counter authoritarianism with the role of both technology and information common issues throughout. Our panel this morning on China information and global democracy is particularly relevant and timely uh, given China's strong recent messaging in response to the very notion of the summit of democracies uh, from which it of course was excluded, uh, including pending joint pieces between the Chinese and Russian ambassadors about the unfairness of US narrative efforts to claim the notion of democracy as its own and China's holding its own uh, international forum on democracy on Monday with the keynote yesterday delivered by the ruling Chinese Communist Party's Minister of Propaganda. This is just the most recent example of Beijing's drive to gain more influence over global discourse and to shape the information space in countries around the world with significant implications for the future of democracy. Uh, and we have a truly excellent panel of experts here today to discuss exactly that topic. Uh, but before we get to our conversation, I'd like to remind everyone of a few brief housekeeping notes. Uh, if you would prefer to watch this session with closed captioning, please navigate to the Atlantic Council and DFR Lab YouTube channels, which have that functionality. Uh, audience members are also encouraged to participate in the discussion through the question and answer box on Zoom. Uh, if you have any questions or comments throughout the panel that you would like to raise, please do send them in. Uh, you can also tweet your questions using hashtag 360stratcom. Uh, and lastly, as this event is one part of a whole, uh, I encourage you to check out the full conference agenda by heading to the Atlantic Council's website. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our fantastic panelists who will each address different aspects of China's approach to shaping information globally and the implications for democracy. Sarah Cook is Research Director for China, Hong Kong and Taiwan at Freedom House. She directs the China Media Bulletin, a monthly digest in English and Chinese, providing news and analysis on media freedom developments related to China. Dr. Glenn Tiffert is a research fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford University and a historian of modern China. And he manages the Hoover Project on China's global sharp power. And Dr. Ameka Umeje is a lecturer in the Department of Communication Studies at the University of Ghana. He is a leading scholar of Chinese media and Chinese digital infrastructure in Africa and author of the book, Chinese Media in Africa, Perception, Performance and Paradox. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have all three of you with us here today. Um, and now I will invite our panelists to give some opening remarks and we will start with Sarah. Thanks, Dave, and, and good morning or good afternoon, depending on what time zone you're in. Um, thanks very much. I'm really looking forward to, to this conversation. So I, I guess I would start um, you know, on this kind of general topic, actually within China, because I think it's so important for understanding what's happening outside China to actually, you know, realize what's changed in China over the last decade. I mean, it's long been ruled by the Communist Party, of course, and been rated, quote, not free, you know, by Freedom House's assessments of civil rights and political, uh, political rights and civil liberties. But really, China domestically has become much more restrictive and the government has become much more um, repressive in, in, in domestically. And, you know, we've seen China's scores drop quite a bit. Um, and I think, you know, it's a combination of, you know, some of it, you know, it's just this closure of space, but really also this increased role for the Communist Party itself within the political system in China. And so I think when we look at what's happening outside of China, you really do see that kind of aggressiveness under Xi Jinping's leadership. Some of this precedes Xi Jinping, but this more aggressive international stance and this kind of priority for the role of the party. Um, influence, United Front Work Department, the Belt and Road Initiative, a lot of that really kind of growing out of what's been happening domestically in China. And I think at our work in Freedom House, we've looked at kind of three aspects of how, um, you know, the Chinese uh, Communist Party is influencing, you know, information flows and freedoms outside of China. One is kind of the export of digital authoritarianism. You see that in terms of both kind of technologies, but also, you know, certain kind of models of, of, of how you deal with, with certain issues um, within, a, within a country. The other is transnational repression and the pursuit, the aggressive pursuit of members of and efforts to silence and even return to China, members of the exile and diaspora communities. 
And the third is kind of this broader media influence toolbox. And so that's what I wanted to kind of focus on. I think that's most relevant to our discussion today. So I, I think really the reality is that, you know, most people may not realize it, but hundreds of millions of people around the world and an increasingly not large number of languages are consuming news that has been influenced by CCP narratives and even directly in terms of the content um, from Chinese states, party state sources, uh, often without being aware of the party state origins. And I think when we look at kind of, you know, I think there's a lot of attention to the expansion of Chinese state media. And I think a lot of the news coverage is about, oh, this Chinese state media responded in this or that way to something that the US said or something that some other government did. But actually, that's just such a small part of the toolbox. And actually, I would say I think that's actually one of the less concerning because I think their messages often don't really stick in many parts of the world. And so we kind of break the toolbox into like really four baskets, I would say. One is a propaganda, the active promotion of Chinese government content and pro-Beijing media outlets and narratives. And some of that is Chinese state media functioning or activities like op-eds by the ambassadors. But there the tie and the link to the Chinese regime is so clear that there is more transparency. But you go down the spectrum and there's, there's various different tactics that have less and less transparency, especially vis-a-vis -vis news consumers. So you have a situation where it might be a paid advertorial that isn't really properly labeled, um, uh, a co-production that isn't really clear that this was done in partnership with the Chinese government or it's kind of at the end in terms of the credits, um, you know, and then purchase of media stakes um, and increasingly, one of the new trends we're seeing is actually social media influencers, particularly tied to China Radio International, but even in other cases where it'll be somebody who, um, again, and if you, might, if you really look closely, you might realize that there's that connection, but they really try to pitch it in a way and, and frame it in a way that this is just somebody talking about China and, and is ostensibly independent. Um, so that's one. I think the other, and this is, again, kind of an emerging trend, is, is this question of disinformation. And that's kind of a combination of the purposeful dissemination of deliberately misleading content, and it's often it's amplification or spread via kind of these fake uh, accounts and inauthentic networks on global social media platforms like Twitter or Facebook or YouTube. And um, that's really a pretty new phenomenon because up until 2017, it's not clear that the Chinese regime was even engaging in that. And most of us didn't notice it until 2018 or 2019 after certain events related to Hong Kong and Taiwan. And then these you know, takedowns started happening and we trace it back and it turns out that it really started in 2017. And this is actually an expanding area of activity for the Chinese government and, and or other party linked actors. It's not always clear who exactly is doing this. Um, and I think we do see an evolution and adaptation and attempt to become more sophisticated and more effective. I think there's still a lot of it that is on scale in terms of quantity and enormous, but it's not really clear how much how much it's sticking, but definitely there's there's clear activity and efforts to get better at this um, in terms of some of the campaigns we see. I think the third I would say is censorship. Um, and so that's the various ways in which you've got kind of either you know physical intimidation, verbal intimidation, pressure on media owners to self-censor their own, so basically censor their own journalists, other pressures that result in self-censorship and avoidance of certain topics. And then other things that are pressure on advertisers and actual like cyber attacks, punishments against outlets that are perceived as being disfavorable or overly critical of the Chinese government. Um, and then the fourth, and again, this is a relatively new development that relates to kind of the broader role that China is playing uh, in the global economy. And that's where you have China-based companies, often with ties to the Chinese government or other, honestly, pressures that they're under domestically um, to engage in surveillance and censorship within China, um, uh, actually basically building or gaining a foothold over keynotes in the information infrastructure in other countries. I think three examples of that would be uh, digital television um, in, in many parts of Africa, but also in parts of Asia and Southeast Asia. Um, Mo mobile phone apps, so WeChat, which is owned by Tencent, is widely used for the Chinese diaspora, but not only by the Chinese diaspora is a clear one. It's an instant messaging e-commerce platform. TikTok, which many of you have heard of, um, but also ByteDance that owns TikTok, owns a number of news aggregators that are really popular in places like Indonesia in the past in India. Um, and actually mobile phone devices to Huawei, Xiaomi, that are also an avenue, you know, where... And I think what's disconcerting is that we're seeing that not only is that foothold there, but then it is being used to manipulate the content, either to amplify certain voices or news sources or to suppress and downplay others. 
And so I would say those are the four ways in which you kind of think of media influence and how it plays out. You know, coming from China and other countries, the propaganda, the disinformation, the censorship, and this control over kind of content uh, delivery and dissemination infrastructure. I think in terms of overall, you know, uh, trends, uh, one is this constant adaptation efforts, increasing efforts to move in a more covert direction to obfuscate those connections and linguistic diversity. So it's not just English, it's not just Chinese, not just Russian or Arabic or Spanish. It's Hebrew, it's Italian, it's Serbian, it's languages, it's Sinhalese. It's languages that are spoken by a few million people. And there's actually quite, I'm like, I'm surprised at how much, um, resources are being devoted to producing content, to having social media influencers, to engaging in disinformation campaigns uh, in, in those languages. So really, I think when you think about it from the Chinese Communist Party's perspective, uh, no, no market is too small. And I, th I think the last point I would add on in terms of kind of the, so I think that infrastructural element in particular uh, is, is relevant. Um, but I think overall, we're talking about topics. One of the evolutions we've seen is that it's not just the kind of core interests of the Chinese Communist Party, which again, obviously actually really affects even when the you know, uh, exile and diaspora communities, Falun Gong practitioners, Hong Kongers, Tibetans, Uyghurs, there are you know, large numbers of people from these communities around the world. But actually this extension into public health issues, into sometimes a local electoral context, um, into local investment projects. And I think that's where you get this intersection and implications for democracy that are more potentially more, more significant. Um, I, I think the last point I would add on in terms of trends, and this is the good news, um, is there aware, public awareness? Is that is having conversations like this? But I think really all over the world, just a growing level of awareness of the challenge um, of this phenomenon, of its dynamics, um, and a real discussion of how to you know square the circle of you know countering or or, or, or increasing resilience vis-a-vis -vis these negative the negative dimensions of of this phenomenon of the coercive and the covert aspects, but still not infringing overly on media freedom, you know, domestically within the country, uh, within other democracies. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there. I don't want to take too much time, but I, I think that's the good news. I think, you know, as much as, you know, as there's more disinformation and activity, there's so much more public awareness and exposure and transparency you know, around the world, really, uh, compared to just three or four years ago. Thanks, Sarah. That was great. Uh, great way to kick us off. And I think a lot to dig into in the conversation, in particular, as you said, some conversation about, you know, the positives that are happening. And I think we can dig in a little bit later to, to some of the uh, the measures that can be taken to, to mitigate uh, some of these effects. Um, so now we'll turn to Glenn. Great, thank you, Dave, and thank you, Sarah, because a lot of the uh, phenomena that Sarah identified are definitely present in the knowledge economy and knowledge sector that I'm going to turn to, particularly universities. You know, by any measure, China has emerged as a global powerhouse in the knowledge economy. Its universities are scaling the league tables of the world's best, its students are among the most talented anywhere, and its researchers score really highly in citation indexes and are among the top partners for international collaborations. In a host of fields, China is now an essential stop on the academic conference circuit. Many labs, departments, universities have developed a supply chain dependence on China scholars, not just for their intellectual contributions, but also for the research grants and the tuition that they bring. So there's a lot to celebrate in that story, except that as China's presence in our knowledge economy has grown, so too has the influence of its illiberal values. And now that Xi Jinping is making a play to recenter the world around his vision of democracy and common destiny, the situation is a bit urgent. Uh, the decentralization, fragmentation, autonomy, openness, and trust that are hallmarks of liberal civil society leave us acutely vulnerable and ill-prepared to recognize the challenges that China poses to free and open knowledge economies or to muster effective responses. Um, we know what the stakes are here because they're playing out before our eyes in, in microcosm. Consider Hong Kong. Publishers now shy away from content that used to be their bread and butter. Libraries have removed formerly popular books from shelves. Schools are changing curriculums. University student unions and NGOs disband. Independent voices in the media go silent. And faculty and teachers increasingly watch what they say and keep their heads down. With mercifully little bloodshed, mainland authorities have pacified what had been an unruly democratic thorn in their side, all under the cover of law. And it's brilliant and chilling at the same time. Closer to home, some of the activities that infringe on the integrity of our knowledge system violate laws. 
through activities such as just outright corruption, but a great many do not. They occupy a gray zone and being civil societies, <clears throat> our institutions must look inside themselves for solutions rather than expect government to save us. Academic cooperation with authoritarian nations such as China routinely entails small Faustian bargains that cumulatively compromise values that we profess to hold dear. And often money is the common solvent. Our libraries increasingly subscribe to digital databases from China that are sanitized to reflect the prevailing political narratives of the moment. And by corrupting the source bases on which our scholars rely, they enlist us in their efforts to control information and narratives often unwittingly. Western presses censor academic content from the PRC market for fear of incurring the wrath of regulators and losing sales, or they partner with heavily subsidized Chinese presses only to discover that those presses insist on imposing PRC censorship standards on publications meant for an international audience. The transgression can be as farcical as not using the Chinese name for the mountain that we know as Everest. More disturbing, some of these publications had international advisory boards of leading Western scholars, and they still do, in spite of their proven contempt for academic freedom. Now, why is that? It's because the individual professional interests of those scholars or even their institutions are not necessarily aligned with the health of the community. As they pursue their own individual goals as free agents, as entrepreneurs in the academic market and the knowledge economy, Whose job is it to attend to the health of the overall system? In a place like China, there is such a coordinating body. It's called the Communist Party. And so the challenge for us is how do we answer that? It used to be that foreign scholars worried about jeopardizing their freedom to do research or in rare cases, obtain visas to go to China. And that was enough to make some think twice about the damage to their professional relationships and careers that might result from incurring the wrath of the Chinese government. And those with loved ones in the PRC, of course, worried about exposing those loved ones to more serious forms of physical risk. This understandably influenced research agendas and how some spoke about China and changed our information system. But now the situation, as Sarah alluded to, has grown more serious. The PRC government has explicitly criminalized research that it does not like on political grounds. Hong Kong's recent national security law goes a step further. It applies extraterritorially, holding scholars criminally liable for opinions expressed anywhere in the world, including classrooms in the United States, UK, Australia, Europe, any place. As a result, mainstream foreign scholars too increasingly worry about their personal safety and the safety of their students in China. Remarkably, just the other day, a Hong Kong official threatened to hold the Wall Street Journal criminally liable under such a law. PRC authorities have in fact punished foreign academic institutions that offended them. They briefly removed a Canadian university from their list of accredited foreign schools in order to steer Chinese students away from it. Similarly, a major PRC scholarship program and, and ended their sponsorship of students at a US university after that university invited the Dalai Lama to speak. Human Rights Watch and most recently ProPublica have documented how PRC authorities monitor the activities of PRC students on US campuses and coerce them into silence in part by pressuring family members in China. University administrators seem powerless to help. And it isn't just the humanities and social sciences that are affected, though we often talk about those the most. Many imagine that the other sciences are less political, but recent scandals regarding informed consent in the collection of genetic information and its application to the repression of minority populations have led to the retraction of published journal articles in major Western journals. Next week, I'll be releasing a report that documents widespread international collaboration with the leading PRC Institute of Artificial Intelligence that also just happens to develop facial iris and gate recognition technologies for applications in mass surveillance and policing in China. Now, such collaborations are generally legal and pursued in the name of global science. But a more basic question is, is this the company that Western scientists, journals, and universities ought to keep if they value research ethics and human rights. Again, in the pursuit of their own self-interest wrapped in the language of freedom and meritocracy, we're neither asking such questions systematically or seeking to answer them, and it diminishes us. 
Defending democratic values is not cost-free, particularly when an illiberal partner dangles monetary incentives and other inducements to look the other way. The costs are felt most keenly in under-resourced parts of the world. And at the end of the day, our influence over many authoritarian countries is limited. China will be China. But for goodness sake, we have responsibility and control over the choices that we make. And so the freedom and autonomy that we cherish in our knowledge economy, such as academic freedom, institutional autonomy, can also be a license to evade and socialize risk in the pursuit of narrow self-interest. The extensive collaboration our knowledge economy enjoys with authoritarian partners is premised on trust. But in the absence of shared democratic values, such trust is fragile and perhaps ill-founded. If we're to maintain that kind of collaboration, then we need to verify by being clear-eyed about our partners and ourselves. That will take resolve, organization, accountability, and changes in our own culture. We can neither expect nor wait for authoritarians to liberalize. The impulse to do better has to come from inside ourselves to make our own democratic values stronger and to live up to them better. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Dave again. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Glenn. That was, that was great. I think really um, highlights how this question of uh, intellectual inquiry and open societies uh, and, and the linkages um, to, to PRC-related entities. Um, it, this is a real uh, important aspect of this question around China and, and information and democracy globally that I think uh, hasn't been as, as uh, addressed as it should be. So that's a really important contribution. And I think also talking about you know, the, the very difficult nature of uh, addressing it in our open societies, you know, whose responsibility is it uh, in a system that is, of course, uh, open uh, and not centrally controlled uh, like, like we have in, in liberal democracy. So uh, we'll dig into that, I, I hope, uh, a lot in, in the conversation uh, that we have after uh, Ameka's uh, presentation. Uh, and that's who I'd like to uh, turn to next. Okay. Um, uh, thank you so much, uh, David. Um, uh, what has happened in recent times is that um, um, there's been some form of a pullback you know, by you know, Chinese state-led media uh, from its engagement in Africa um, to have more of um, private media engagements on the continent with local um, African media organizations. So this is what, it, what, 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 what we have now is called uh, a kind of a multifaceted um, approach um, to media and information engagement um, in Africa. So, uh, I mean, so there are different, um, what I call it vehicles through which uh, this, um, um, these influence operations are carried out. Um, first, you have the you have the Belt and Road Belt and Road News Network, uh, stroke Belt and Road News News Alliance. Um, this this is a kind of collaboration between um, Chinese state-led media organizations and African media organizations. And what happens in this effect is that um, um, the messaging is being done by African media organizations, not by Chinese state-led media organizations any longer. So if you are, we, why it would be easier um, to have some of this messaging on the Chinese media, state media platform, but Africans would gladly believe this uh, messaging if it happens uh, via um, African media organizations. So for instance, um, somebody in Nigeria would gladly believe um, messaging on NTA or a local TV station, a local newspaper um, that is you know, uh, providing Chinese uh, propaganda. So it makes it easier to believe and to believe it when it's uh, being mediated through um, China state-led media organization. So this is the kind of approach. Um, then um, you, I don't know if you follow closely the, uh, the recently concluded um, 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 FOCAC summit in Dakar, Senegal. Um, one of the things that happened there was the China Media Group Organized Corporation Forum. It was a forum that brought about 40, 42 um, broadcast media organizations from Africa and the China Media Group. And one of the resolutions was that um, um, the actors, I mean, participants will be responsible public information disseminators. Uh, and, you know, when, when we say responsible, you know what that means, you know, <laughs> responsible, uh, it's also amount to uh, objectivity. You know, that is in Chinese term, in China's own understanding. Uh, when China says you have to be responsible information disseminator, it means that you have to handle information um, uncritically. So 
um, you know, the kind of information to engage with you, understand um, that information is, um, won't hurt certain interests in China. You know, so that is very critical. Um, then one of the resolution that was also reached at that uh, uh, um, forum was that um, both sides will amplify Chinese and African voices on the global stage. Now, but you understand that um, between, when you talk about China-African relations, Africa, the African agency is very, very limited. And uh, if you also go to the media space, which I have investigated over, over time, you find that African journalists and African editors have very, very limited uh, agency, um, even to um, edit stories the way they would want to, or to write stories the way they want to. So when, uh, when a forum organized by the China Media Group talks about um, amplifying Chinese and African voices on the global stage, you would agree with me that uh, that would amount to amplifying Chinese voices on the global stage to be to the advantage of, of, of China. Um, so that, that is that for um, one of the things that came out of the uh, FOCAC um, um, 2021 in, in Dakar. Then again, you have some of these uh, platforms, you have the digital infrastructure that we all know, um, funding fiber optics in Africa, investing in ICT, uh, in Africa, which forms part of uh, China's Digital Silk Road uh, initiative in Africa. And um, then you have issues of um, um, transparency, you have issues of uh, um, um, bribery and corruption, you have issues of uh, um, information trafficking, because in Africa, people are not really bothered about the information. People just say, I mean, what's my, what's my, I mean, what's China going to do with that information? They don't need anything, I mean, but we know what it is. Um, if we, we should be conscious of that. So then we have issues of cyber sovereignty, you know, um, because one of the issues that we have, have, us, have, uh, uh, have tried to highlight over time is that there's a, pre a prediction from the way things are going that there will be a total decoupling between China and the US. Uh, in the technology space. So we are likely to see maybe in 10 to 20 years time where we have a divergence of the internet. So we have, for instance, uh, a US-led um, version of the internet which uh, promotes uh, uh, a multi-stakeholder uh, uh, internet norms and um, a Chinese-led version of the internet which, you know, hiding under the umbrella of uh, multilateralism promote cyber sovereignty. Now, most of the digital infrastructure in Africa, about 70% of it has been built by uh, Huawei and ZTE. Now, if the internet diverges into two, what happens to Africa? Would Africa say, okay, because I mean, most, some of these countries in Africa, most of them are used to freedom of information. And uh, I'm aware, I, you should be aware that about uh, a few months ago or thereabout, or if, yeah, uh, most of these countries gathered in, in, in Namibia where uh, information was declared as a public good. Um, so which means that uh, it, the, the information should be sacrosanct. So we, we shouldn't um, undermine you know, information because when you undermine access to information, you undermine public good, right? So if now we have these two, we have the cyber sovereignty and the US-led model, and most African infrastructures are leaning on Chinese digital infrastructure. Um, what happened is that China would likely recognize, I mean, the advantage they have over African countries. So in the long run, we have a situation whereby um, China says, well, if you don't want to um, adopt cyber sovereignty, uh, we, pull, uh, we pull the plug on you and I mean, you, you have nowhere to go. But like I say, most times, um, Af African countries tend to find themselves in the in form of a bind, you know, because in the immediate, in the immediate Africa needs digital infrastructure, ICT infrastructure um, to meet uh, the demand of uh, um, digital uh, innovation. But then in the long run, what happens? In the long term, it's going to be certain crisis. But the problem is that uh, most African political actors and policymakers, we tend to think in the, in the short term because we want to show the people that we are working, we are delivering the deviance of democracy. But people are not thinking what happens after wars. How is it going to affect um, information? How is it going to affect um, human rights, political pluralism in Africa? These are critical issues. Then again, we have um, things like content sharing agreement happening from, you know, through Xinhua news agency um, with many African news agencies. This is happening and so many African media organizations. And this is free of charge. So 
I mean, if Xinhua is going to give me uh, uh, content free of charge, why should I bother myself to subscribe to Reuters to subscribe? So, I mean, uh, you know, most African media organizations are, are struggling. So, this is an encouragement for them. So, um, we have to take this into account. Then you have issues of um, journalist media exchanges. This has been this has increased over time. There have been a lot of training for journalists going to China uh, to get media training. And you see, from the research that we have done, we found out that most of these journalists come back with this conception of, wow, you know. Um, they say, well, they are trying to influence you to do media the Chinese way. Um, but they, they also get exposed to Chinese media sources. They now get used to, they have this contextual knowledge about China. So they're able to report about China better than other people have not gone there. They also have access to more Chinese media sources, which other journalists do not have. So we're increasingly seeing that this is increasing also. Um, so what you have in the long run is that um, um, in Africa, um, the influence is not coming from one angle, you know, it's not just coming from just the Beta and Rodney's and network, it's coming from the journalists. Um, there are also Chinese digital news platform, you know, coming up in Africa. We have the Oprah News Hub, you know, from Nigeria spreading to other parts of Africa. So these are also imagined. So in the long run, we'll have a multifaceted uh, influence operation going on on the African continent. And I mean, how do you, you know, to contend with this is, a, is, is, is critical and it's important at this stage. So, um, I think this is what happened in Africa, and this is how China is moving. And this whole thing falls under the framework of the Belt and Road uh, Initiative, because um, more funding is being um, um, channeled um, under the platform using the Belt and Road uh, Initiative as, a, as, a, you know, as an overarching platform to uh, achieve these goals. Yeah, so for now, thank you. Thanks, Omeka, that was, that was great. And I think really rounded out our panel nicely with kind of zeroing into what, you know, what China's approach to information influence is in, you know, across a region like Africa and uh, and in individual African countries and what those effects are um, and tying it to the Belt and Road News Network and the Belt and Road Initiative, which I think, you know, there's been a lot of commentary lately, I think a little over inflated about, you know, the, the premature death or failure of the Belt and Road Initiative, but understanding that these efforts are really tied into that, I think is really important. And then your points about you know the the how this relates to China's pushing of cy cyber sovereignty, its version of the internet, and some of these ICT issues, and China's role uh, through Huawei, through CTE, um, in digital infrastructure uh, across the continent, uh, I think also are really important issues that perhaps we can uh, dig into more. Um, I want to uh, encourage the audience to um, to throw some questions in the chat function and please uh, participate. We you know look forward to to your thoughts and your comments and questions. Um, but I wanted to, to kick us off here um, with, you know, bringing this conversation to, to something that's kind of ripped from the headlines today uh, initially, which is uh, the, the news today about the uh, U.S. diplomatic boycott of the Olympics, uh, which, as everyone knows, is, you know, a big um, important uh, event for China uh, occurring in Beijing in February uh, that's supposed to add to China's uh, global stature and reputation. So I, I want to start out by asking anyone who wants to answer how, you know, how you think China will uh, look not just to use the tools that each of you have discussed uh, to try to ensure its own narrative on the U.S. move can compete effectively for attention uh, globally and in countries, but also what it might do in those individual countries, especially potential allies that might join the boycott, um, but also countries, for example, throughout Africa, uh, to shape the discourse, to attempt to isolate Washington, to make it look like Washington's alone in this and just you know, it's part of Washington's grand Cold War plan to uh, to counter China, um, and also to counter a sense basically that there's a more widespread sentiment uh, about China's human rights abuses growing uh, globally. So curious if anyone has uh, thoughts on uh, that. I can just um, just take a try. I, I, what, what I think may happen is that you would see um, maybe African uh, political actors um saying i mean we we do not we do not align with the us um we will go to we will, i mean they would not say we're not align with the us because that will also <laughs> that, will, that will raise some issues but they would just say well um we are going to go to Beijing. um we don't know we don't we don't know what has happened we are not interested in um in that global politics um we're going to the olympic that we're not interested in whatever happened at the global politics we're not taking sides I mean, I mean, if you during the the, the Cold War, um, we are not saying this is. I mean, a, a kind of um, manifestation of the Cold War. But here we are, whether we agree or not. Um, during the Cold War, it was we neither look east or we neither look uh, west, right? 
So you could see Africa, African political actors try to um, replay that narrative and say, well, it doesn't concern us what happens between um, US and China. We just want to go to the Olympics. Uh, we believe it's, um, it's global, it's games, and um, this, this is sports, and uh, we don't care the politics about it. We just want to participate in the sports part of it. That, that could happen. Then again, uh, don't also be surprised if you have to see um, a lot of uh, OPEC, you know, opinion articles. Um, imagine in African media uh, organization saying, well, um, maybe editorial saying, but why should the US, how, has he, how does what is happening in China, how does it concern the US? I mean, I mean the human rights issue is, is a Chinese issue. Why is US getting involved in Chinese issue? You know, uh, because China itself does not get involved in any in, in other countries' um, internal politics, you know, or internal affairs. So that could that narrative could come up. You know, they could play up that narrative and say, well, China does not involve interfere in people's uh, in other countries' internal affairs. Why is US interfering in China's affair? You could see that happen. That could form a viable media narrative to you know to counter um, the effect of uh, these boycotts. Yeah, that's what I think. Thank you. D Dave, I wonder if I could step in too. Yeah. I mean, for, uh, for a number of years now, China has been developing a really strong and multidimensional narrative about anti-hegemonism and how US standards are not global standards, they're US standards. There's no, you know, the US does not get to decide, for example, what a democracy is. The US does not get to decide what human rights are. And China has an alternative model that it's presenting to the rest of the world. Um, you know, and in fact, China, can point to its record over the last 40 years and say, this is a model that works, you know, whereas as the recent democracy white paper that they issued just the other day says US democracy in fact does not work, um, right? And so um, I think you can see a response um, building on this narrative that, like I say, was introduced several years ago and is multidimensional to the Olympics saying, well, that's just the US thinking that it can set the terms for the world. And instead, you know, we rally the world around us. And it's in a sense, very Maoist. It, it reminds me of those old posters from the Cultural Revolution that would have Mao at the center of a sea of, you know, brown and black faces from around the world. Uh, China leading the peoples of the world forward in an anti-hegemonic, anti-imperialist struggle. It's tapping into exactly that same iconography. Um, so this is reaching into their playbook in a way uh, to, to seize control of the narrative. Um, so having looked at, so I think there's a few things. I think one, um, probably the biggest fear is that there's going to be more countries that um, join the United States. I think we've seen, actually, Lithuania was the first. The U.S. has gotten a lot more attention, but Lithuania was the first democratic government. Uh, New Zealand also says it won't be sending, but interestingly, they're saying it's because of the pandemic. So I think you could see a situation where even if there are some countries in the, you know, in Africa and other parts of the world, they don't want to rub Beijing the wrong way, but maybe they do feel some domestic pressure not to send a delegation. They won't say, oh, well, it's because of the human rights violations in China. It's because of what they're doing to the Uyghurs. They'll say, oh, well, it's because of the pandemic. We just wanted to, you know, there's a new variant. We want to be careful or something like that. So I think, um, and, you know, I, I think there could be that kind of maneuvering. I think the messaging is interesting in that, and actually just having looked a little bit, um, I think, you know, one is going to be, I, so I think it's going to be trying to paint and, and really pressure other countries not to follow the U.S. So, for example, in Lithuania, there's a cartoon. Uh, um, Lithuania's Uncle Sam teleprompter. This is China. This is the China Global Television Network. And basically talking about how Lithuania has gone further and has been smearing the China's treatment of the Uyghurs. And so I think there's a lot of messaging that's going to be even further amplified related to uh, controlling the message on what's happening to Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And that's where we've been seeing like another big takedown of a disinformation network, for example. But, um, and, you know, I've been engaging in Ty with Taiwan and uh, boycotting the Beijing Olympics. And then here's the, the kind of takeaway. It's being used as a cat's paw of the United States and Lithuania will pay a big price for that eventually. And there were a number of other pieces where I saw that this kind of like threat now, like this threat messaging was like, don't rub us the wrong way or you will pay a consequence. And we all know what some of those consequences can be monetarily in terms of trade limits and things like that. So I think there's definitely this element of trying to use that economic leverage to uh, to discourage, you know, other countries uh, from joining this kind of political boycott. 
I do think that if other countries join, they're probably just going to downplay it. Like they're not going to make a big CGTN announce. Like that was the one thing on Lithuania. I did a quick search. They're not, they have many more articles about the US because they want to make it seem bilateral. If you start to see, you know, the fact if you start to see more European countries, especially if you start to see countries from the global south announcing a diplomatic boycott or maybe quietly engaging it, CGTN isn't going to broadcast that because it actually plays into their messaging much more to say, well, this is just the US. And I think like that China. Um, uh, create a perception of isolating the United States, but I do think they're also going to double down even more on this issue of what what's you know what's happening in Xinjiang and trying to counter the the evidence of of the horrific atrocities happening there and to others in China, um, um, and to try to undermine some of the conversation about that as a motivator for a political boycott. Great, thanks to all of you. That's great answers, and I think um, I, I agree. I think the the importance of having uh, other countries uh, in addition to Lithuania and the United States coming out and uh, potentially making a, making the same move uh, is that it, it certainly complicates what the kind of messaging that China will want to be putting out there. Um, it'll be really interesting to watch just China's messaging uh, and information efforts leading up to the Olympics over the next couple of months. Um, I wanted to ask a question from the audience. This was uh, directed at Ameka, but I think it's, you know, for, for anyone to, to answer, which is, you know, are you aware of any examples of China using this media influence capacity to influence elections or promote electoral disinformation? Uh, and I would add to that, you know, even make it a little broader, even to, to undermine, you know, the kind of political accountability and to, and to reduce the chances uh, in various ways for candidates who might take positions that are uh, antithetical to China's interests. Um, so, uh, Amika, we'll start with you if you want to answer that, but uh, also open it to others. Uh, no, you can go on with others. Um, I'll come back to it later. Is that fine? Uh, well, yeah, I think, I mean, there's good evidence of social media manipulation, for example, in Taiwan uh, to affect uh, Taiwan's domestic political system in the Taiwanese election. Uh, and a lot of this, uh, you know, attribution is always a challenge in these cases, but there's subtle signals like the word choice and, and language used that indicate that, you know, disinformation was originating in, in mainland origin Chinese speakers as opposed to the turns of phrase that would be predominant on, on Taiwan. Similarly, um, there have been um, suggestions of in, in local races in Australia and in Canada as well. Um, that particular people were, were being backed by United Front activities and within the Chinese language space on WeChat, for example, disinformation was being spread in order to tip Chinese language dominant voters one way or the other. Um, we haven't seen allegations rise to the level of what's, for example, been alleged in the US presidential election with Russian involvement in 2016 yet, but it's something that we need to be alert to uh, because China's constantly raising its game and changing its methods. So far, it's, it's, its activities haven't stuck, but it's trying. Uh, and so it's worth watching and never taking our eyes off of. Yeah, I would just echo Glenn's point about about Taiwan. That's where it's been the most the most obvious. I think there was one Facebook takedown related to the Philippines that seemed to indicate that there was some effort to kind of amplify certain information about um, Duterte, but then also I think maybe about some competitors. And they're going to be having elections, in, you know, spring next year. So that's one question. I think what was remarkable there was that they these messages from the fake accounts did actually get some engagement. Um, and so I think that's um, one thing. I, I would just echo what Glenn was saying about the local races, I think, including in the United States. I think that's where there's much more likelihood to be an attempted influence or to actually be able to have some kind of impact because the margins are much weaker. And sometimes the information, you, you know, exchanges and, and the you know, Facebook groups, things like that, it's just it's much harder to track. Um, and so I think it's just a greater a greater vulnerability. Um, I, I think the other thing that you see in terms of politics more broadly is more this kind of Kremlin-esque thing of trying to amplify discord. So like amplifying certain hashtags or messages related to racial divisions in the United States um, or amplifying on the fringes in other places or amplifying um, a sentiment in Italy or in Serbia that you know is, is sees the EU as not assisting during COVID, right? Um, so I think, or there was even this really weird campaign of like pretending to be Taiwanese and supporting like Californian separatism. So, I mean, that's like, you know, kind of, <laughs> I don't think anybody's really gonna buy it. Of course you could tell because of the way they were using certain characters and stuff like that, the way they referred to Taiwan. Um, but um, 
but but I think you do see, you know, this element of these small examples of trying to tip into the local, uh, local, you know, political space, uh, not only surrounding elections, but just in general, in terms of kind of social cohesion and, and social divisions. Uh, but there's a lot more damage that could be done if they get better at it. Okay, uh, <clears throat> I don't, from, in Africa, I have not been able to isolate a particular incident um, that I could say, well, this is China doing, you know, um, this information regarding any election in Africa. Um, but what has happened over time is that uh, people could latch on a government being very close to China and say, well, because this government is close to China, we don't want them in the next election. This happened in, I mean, this happened in Zambia. We also saw some of that in, um, um, in Syria alone. Um, when the people said uh, the APC government was, um, uh, that, well, they said China, were, they said some Chinese people were part of what the, um, the just the vest, I think the Jesse of the APC um, government uh, during electioneering campaign that happened in Syria alone. Uh, but in terms of uh, disinformation that strictly I tend to connect them, I have not been able to identify that But these instances of, um, um, connection you know um, maybe they are individual they are not they are uh, individual chinese or whatever it is but people tend to say well this government uh was too close to china we don't want it again and it goes unfortunately sometimes the next government come and it goes back to china too so it's a <laughs> it's a complicated thing in africa yeah yeah that's what I, that's what i've yeah seen yeah. yeah that's interesting i'd be curious you know and i haven't dug into it but in individual countries like zambia you know whether yeah. you know some of the messaging propaganda you know content exchange effects for instance in the recent election with lungu if there were if there was you know a market step up in what you know the prc was putting out there or supporting in terms of messaging about um you know the opposite candidate who ultimately won who had a more of a uh not friendly to china message but um but i think that that'd be an interesting area to to dig into um, Jane, I wonder if I could yeah. just add a, a footnote to what we've all said. And I think um, you know, the question of foreign influence, whether it's in social media or whether it's in campaign finance, is really a subset of larger weaknesses and vulnerabilities that our systems have domestically, right? So, I mean, I think we, we ought to be worried about foreign interference in social media and our election system, but we also have much more serious and graver problems domestically along those lines. And the solution is really the same. Uh, it's, to, it's to make them more resilient and more democratic. Uh, and so maybe that, that gives us the impetus to redouble our efforts in that regard. I think that's a that's a really great point. It actually links to a question that came in from uh, David Ronfeld, which is, you know, what can we say about what China's information influence operations are inside the United States, specifically uh, related to the fact that a lot of Chinese theorists and strategists um, and arguably leaders believe that U.S. society and culture are kind of coming apart and they want to exploit uh, and accelerate that. And that, that links to, I think, exactly what you're saying, uh, Glenn. Uh, if anyone has any additional thoughts on that, I certainly welcome it. Um, but I uh, just want to add a, another question as well uh, from the audience, which is uh, around uh, cyber capabilities and how they relate to this question. And the question is, do China's increasing offensive cyber capabilities affect how organizations like overseas foundations, think tanks, and others approach efforts to support democracy and human rights activists and advocates uh, within China? Does the possibility of cyber retribution uh, from the Chinese government affect how these organizations are approaching their work. So any any thoughts on that also would be welcome. I, yeah, I think the answer is absolutely. I mean, we have to be particularly attentive to the safety of individuals that we work with, to you know the personal safety of informants who speak to us in a way that, that was never the case before. Um, I think a lot of institutions have had to raise their, their cyber defense game significantly in recent years because they're constantly under attack and personal internet hygiene has become a major issue for many of us who work in this space. Um, you know, we uh, we regularly get phishing attempts, fairly sophisticated ones too. So yes, um, China is is has taken an interest, and I think as Sarah said, it's remarkable their the level of capability and attention that even the smallest players in this space will get from the Chinese government. Yeah, I would echo that point, and I think the, you know I think on the United States. Um, you know, there have been, you know, on the disinformation side, you've got kind of, you know, these some campaigns, there was one text message, one that related to trying to sow panic surrounding the early lockdowns around COVID. 
Um, there was one of these networks of like pers more persona accounts, some more kind of Kremlin-like type strategy that um, uh, that did have some posts that related to say amplifying, uh, claiming there was um, uh, uh, manipulation of the 2020 elections, for example. I mean, I don't know, it's not clear that those got had like a huge impact, right? But you do see these kind of, these attempts. I think, um, I think, I think, I think one thing I would say kind of commenting off of what, um, and, and I think I would just echo what Glenn said in terms of kind of, you know, cyber hygiene. And I think just the care with which how people communicate. And you see this, you know, again, in terms of how professors are dealing with students who are now based in Hong Kong or based, I think for us, it's really been the shift in Hong Kong where there were people there we were regularly in touch with, we would travel there and suddenly it's basically like mainland China. And even, even you have to be even more careful because it's under such a close microscope um, by the regime and the security forces now compared to what it was just a couple of years ago. And even compared to China, which is so much larger too. Um, I, I think one thing I would say related to kind of Glenn's earlier interventions, and this is something we see around the world in terms of how the influence works, is that there is a very close connection between kind of the political and academic influence and the media influence. And I think that's really important because like we're hearing, we're doing a project now with local analysts and Mika's actually working with us on that, on how this is playing out in different countries. And we're hearing again, again, that actually the footholds in the academia really influence the media because professors will be, will self-censor and will not want to go on the record for a radio talk show talking about something related to China, talking about whether it's something inside China or investments or things like that, that um, so that, that that really, you know, it does play out and influence who can be the common, who are willing to be commentators on the record in the media. And same thing with the political actors, where like you see a government that is just very pro-China and they themselves have their own influence on the media narratives. So China doesn't even have to do anything. They're just, they're just guiding narratives, even in more democratic societies or in terms of how it plays out in the political spectrum, where you'll see the media that are pro that politician will be more pro China and then the opposition are going to be more critical of the Chinese government and Chinese investments and things like that. So you definitely see this very close um, relationship between how things play out in the media space and how other forms of Chinese Communist Party influence are, 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 are coming into societies. And I think you could, you know, the United States is such a huge market. It's kind of hard to say how that plays out. But I think um, I think in the U.S. one of the biggest vulnerabilities is really the local level. Well, uh, I mean, in Africa, um, even if it happens in Africa, people don't seem to care much, you know. Um, I remember the instance in Uganda uh, when I think that story was in uh, the WSJ, um, which um, an investigation that found that um, some Huawei technicians helped the Ugandan government to spy on the opposition um, in Uganda. So um, um, that happened. That that. Could happen often in Africa, but people don't seem to really uh, care so much. Uh, I don't mean, uh, or people don't have the technological capacity uh, to to know what is happening. So nobody seems to care because uh, there's no capacity to uh, identify such threats. So it just goes on and goes on and goes on until maybe um, there's an external help from from the global north, for instance like you have with the, um, the WSJ story, uh, it comes to light, but without that, it just keeps on going and uh, we move on like that, unfortunately, yeah. Yeah, uh, thanks, thanks, those were great responses. I wanna um, ask what's probably our last question, um, which relates to, you know, each of you have talked about some of the effects on democracy from the, the information shaping tools that China is using. Um, I want to ask kind of a broader question, uh, you know, related to the fact that China in recent years has been increasing its messaging on China's ability to provide countries with an alternative model to development and, and governance that's not premised on what they would call Western style democracy. We've seen calls in China for more foreign propaganda about China's model, specifically uh, on, on Xi Jinping thought. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm curious, uh, as we see more pieces coming out about uh, China's path of economic modernization, contributing uh, to China's wisdom for the international community and things like this, including a piece recently that stated specifically, we should step up efforts to tell the story of China from the perspective of academic research, uh, in addition to through the media. So just curious, as we close out here, if any of you have thoughts on how you expect these information tools you've discussed to be employed in this drive to promote China's model of governance, 
and how effective uh, are those uh, tools? Um, and you know, what's the balance of, of what's most effective uh, in terms of pushing this notion uh, that that development can be achieved following uh, China's model and not going through uh, democracy and, and, and liberal institutions? Uh, can I go first? Yeah, please. Um, well, um, I think one of the things that um, uh, the, the democracy, the summit on democracy has um, provided an opportunity first for the, the, I mean, the kind of the US uh, model to interface with African political actors and policy makers. Um, and, you know, the greatest, the greatest uh, impediment to uh, countering or countervailing China's influence uh, model in Africa is um, the, the buy-in of African police, political actors and policy makers. So through this summit, I believe it provides an opportunity um, for a kind of um, um, a, a coordinated approach. And this would mean um, having political actors in, from Africa, having policymakers from Africa, having the media, having academic researchers, you know, coordinated approach. And so, you know, um, you, why some are fitting into policy, some are fitting into the public domain, some are fitting into the political domain. So in the long run, you have um, a kind of um, consolidated um, um, approach um, to countering China's um, model in Africa. Um, so if this happens, and this requires funding and less of bureaucracy, um, because this is where the challenge lies, you know, um, even though promises are made, but they are not followed up. Um, but when China makes their own promises, they follow up and funding is, you know, accessible because, because of less bureaucracy, you know, uh, on the, because it's an authoritarian regime. So they can also say, oh, we are going to Africa tomorrow. Everybody goes. I mean, but if it happens, if the USA were going to Africa tomorrow, uh, there has to be processes. I mean, transparent processes, you, you would mean, yeah. So these are certain issues that have to be taken to places. There are academic researchers in Africa who should be funded. There are journalists who should also be trained. There are journalists who should be informed about China. They don't know. They don't they just report whatever they see. I mean, um, if we look at the last FOCAC uh, uh, outcome, people are just reporting, oh, China is going to give about $12 billion, but they, they $12 billion. But they have not realized that it has come down from $60 billion to where it is. So nobody, so nobody reported it like that. It was all positive stories, but we are seeing, um, you know, a reduction in funding. But that is not the story. But if you look at the international press, you will see that 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 you will see that came through. But in African media, there's nothing like that. Is because the journalists do not know any of these. They do not understand what is happening. They don't even know what FOCAC is. Some of them. So I think we should focus on training journalists and retaining journalists in Africa, um, getting the media involved. Uh, funding academic research that focus on, you know, China in Africa, and then, you know, um, getting political actors and policymakers uh, to know the long-term effect of uh, of the immediate gain of China's um, influence operation in Africa. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Omeka. That was a great way to kind of uh, wrap us up. I think, unfortunately, we are at, at time, um, uh, but I appreciate you kind of throwing it at the end there. Uh, we could spend a whole other hour talking about all the measures that need to be uh, taken to, to mitigate uh, some of these challenges uh, to democracies. Uh, but I think this has been a, a fantastic panel and conversation. I wanna thank our panelists uh, and also thank you to the audience uh, for joining us. Uh, as mentioned at the outset, uh, this event is part of the 360 Stratcom conference. And I encourage you to join other sessions for interesting takes on tech and on democracy and information issues, and also timely commentary on issues that will be discussed at the Summit for Democracy. The full conference agenda, as well as the recordings of other sessions, can be accessed via the Atlantic Council website. Uh, thanks again to everyone and have a fantastic day.